Thank you.
Someone said there are old pilots and bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. Wisdom hopefully helps us to make decisions that are prudent and not uh, just kind of uh, flying, if you will, by the seat of our pants. We'll talk about that tonight. Pastor Mark Hensley here from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church right in my office. And then the other side of this camera is my wife, Laura. Hi, Laura. Thank you for being here tonight to watch, to be a part of this study. We continue in the book of Acts tonight. Acts chapter 4, where the disciples are bold. They're told not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. And their response is, we can't but help but speak of the things we've seen and heard. After they were punished, they go, as you know, back to, um, to their families and where the church was gathered. And they were honored that they had suffered in the name of Jesus. And they prayed specifically for boldness. We'll look at that tonight. We'll also look at how the early church uh, cared for one another. And it's, um, it's a challenging um, reminder that uh, we should be other-minded. Great to have you tonight, wherever you're watching from. Let us know how we can pray for you. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. Thank you for your word. We ask that you would teach um, us through the indwelling Holy Spirit what your uh, thoughts are specifically as it relates to Acts 4 tonight. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter 4, I just for context, I want to pick up in verse 29 of Acts 4. And now, Lord... Consider their threats, and grant that your servants may speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand for healing, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God boldly. Boldness is... Uh, sometimes uh, difficult uh, to uh, experience when we're a bit um, reluctant or shy. And, but this boldness that you see in Acts 4 came from the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. God enabled them to be bold. It's one thing to be bold when you're in church or in an office with your wife doing a... Uh, a Bible study like this, but the challenge is to be bold wherever you go, and you can be when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Bold doesn't mean rude. Bold simply means um, willing to state the convictions of your heart as it relates to the things of God. I remember uh, some years ago, I pastored a lady. Uh, I won't tell you where or how long ago it was, but it was years ago. And she um, could be quite rude and sometimes very uh, direct to people and would often, as a disclaimer, you'll remember this, would say, well, I have the gift of prophecy. And I thought, well, I think you have the gift of being rude. But to be bold isn't to be rude. It's to be demonstrative, <clears throat> yielded to the Holy Spirit, and verbally uh, ready to speak the, uh, the truth in love. So I find it so interesting how they were determined to be bold. And they asked God specifically for boldness. And what I love about this passage, and I save this, obviously the last part of chapter 4, especially for tonight, because you think, you think of the church. Do you remember doing this sometimes? Uh, here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door. There's all the people. Remember that. Well, the church, of course, as we understand it, is much more than bricks and mortar and shingles. The church is God's people. In fact, the word church or ecclesia means the called out ones, those who have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of his dear son. So the church uh, is really... You and I, redeemed by the blood of Christ, wherever we are on any given day, uh, the church at right now is in Fountain, most likely. Some of the church is in Wyoming. Uh, the church uh, is gathered at uh, 3725 El Moro Road. 
and two members of the church are in this office. And the point is, is the church is God's people released under the authority of God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to be impactful. And um, people watch us all the time. And when they see us, do they see that we are genuine, that we're real? Some years ago when uh, Laura and I were in seminary and she was helping uh, me get through seminary and working at Alcon Laboratory and I was going to school. I remember um, one time I was um, at that house in North Fort Worth where we lived briefly and and uh, we had uh, an 80, uh, was he 80, 77 years old, 87 years old, I can't remember. And um, But the pastor there, I was the associate for a brief time and um, someone had come to his door asking for help, asking for financial help. And uh, the pastor quickly just uh, refused him and said, well, you didn't ask to work. You didn't want to work for it. And so I'm not going to give you anything. And I thought, you know, uh, what it said in the book of James, if a brother or sister comes to you naked and in need of daily provision, and by the way, naked means ill-clothed. They need clothes and they need food. And you say to them, God bless you. Be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you don't give them what they really need. James, the half-brother of our Lord, will say, what good is your faith? Faith and works really go hand in hand. And remember this, we are saved by grace alone. John Calvin said, but the grace that saves is not alone. So this young man came to me. Somehow I was in the church there. And he, after being rebuked by the older pastor, came to me. And I remember taking him down to a, a like a fast food place, you know, in North Fort Worth, getting him something to eat. But I will never forget, Laura, he was amazed that this pastor did not want to help him with a legitimate physical need at this point it was hunger well the world expects us to be different the difference that you see at the very tail end of acts 4 is profound they have been called on the carpet for testifying in the name of jesus the whole thing started when a man who'd been born with the inability to walk or bear weight is miraculously healed on a day while laying outside the beautiful gate. He immediately, uh, upon being healed, springs to his feet and is full of exuberance and joy and pandemonium kind of takes over the synagogue, uh, the worship services that day at the temple. And Peter and John begin to preach. And the people are looking at them as if they had something to do with the man's healing. And Peter immediately deflects and says, don't look at us. It wasn't us which is the good response, any good that we do, any difference we make, it's because of Christ in us who's the hope of glory. But there is, never forget, an expectation, even in a cynical, secular world, that we are to be different. Well, we know we're to be different anyway. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works that he's prepared for us to do in advance. That is, after you're saved, there are opportunities that will present themselves to you to make a difference and to help people to uh, not be resistant, to not be distant, to get in the fray, to get in the game. And I think it's so important that we understand when it, the Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, where God's workmanship, the word workmanship means poems. It's the idea of a masterpiece. God has created us given us life, redeemed us, given us eternal life, adopted us into his family. We are heirs and joint heirs of God in Christ. And he's saved us for a purpose. Some of the most unhappy people, Laura, I've met in my life are not non-Christians. Non-Christians don't know any difference. They think uh, their life is fine, many of them, and they find contentment in that. The people I find that are most miserable are Christians who aren't walking with the Lord because deep down they know God has rescued me and delivered me from darkness and translated me into the kingdom of his son, light, 
to be just that, light and salt in a watching world. When you get to the end of Acts 4, you get a glimpse of what the early church was like. When we read it initially, you will think, sounds like communism. Well, the thing is, it's so different than communism because this is how a church should be in the verses we're about to read. That doesn't mean that we empty our bank accounts and we uh, all live in this, under the same roof and sing Kumbaya. It just means that we realize everything I have and everything I am is by the grace of God. And when God's Holy Spirit brings the legitimate need into my life, I need to take seriously the opportunity to meet that need. Now, not every um, inquiry or question has to be answered necessarily from our checking account, but I do. Remember this, someone once said, we should never pray for anyone without realizing God may prompt us to be the tangible evidence of that prayer being answered. Now, God answers the prayer, but he gives us the ability many times to do it. So the text, I just love it because you get a glimpse of what the early church was all about. And then you see the church today and you, you think, boy, there's a great gulf fixed between the two. But there doesn't have to be. Notice verse 32 and following to the end of the chapter. Acts 4. Now the entire group of those who believed were of one heart and mind. And no one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But instead they had everything in common. With great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them. For there was not a needy person among them, because all those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. Then this was distributed to each person as any had need. We'll stop there. We'll save the last verse, our last few verses for the very end of our time together. So when you read that no one uh, first of all, you notice, first of all, um, they were one heart and one mind. They were unified. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. Uh, they, uh, they had differing opinions. We all do. But they were pulling together in the same direction. When you think about it, unity is such a critical component of a church. In our uh, 33 years of ministry, 40 years of marriage, 7 years of preparation, 33 years of ministry, uh, Laura and I have seen from time to time a church not unified. That's a trip through Ulcer Gulch, isn't it? When people who should be pulling together are pulled apart. And all of a sudden, one person has this idea and this agenda. And, and then everything just becomes uh, fractured and frustrating. Unity. If you have unity in a church, you should be thankful, thanking God all the time. I read once that there's... Any church in America is 24 hours away from a major conflict. Did you know that? And so um, make sure that we protect, you protect, I protect the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, the Bible says. That means uh, as much as possible within you, live at peace with all men and all women. Um, speak the truth in love, but be gracious, be forgiving. We need to forgive because God's forgiven us. And we need to... Keep short accounts. We need to esteem others above ourselves. We need to be forgiving and tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. We don't need to be people who uh, speak harshly or uh, negatively uh, about people to their face or behind their back. The Bible warns uh, in Ephesians 4 about how we should not uh, practice malice. I had to look that up once. Malice means a willing desire to hurt someone. That's not who we are. It's not who we belong to. And if you find yourself in a conflicted church, ask the Lord to bring unity to that place. They were unified. They were in one heart and one mind. And that's what the Lord prayed for when he prayed in John 17, that great prayer to his father. 
And it's what these first believers demonstrated, Tony Evans wrote. When there is disunity, the spirit, he said, does not work. Isn't that the truth? That's why unity is so critical. Unity is essential for every church. Then you see that they didn't claim any possessions as their own. It means they were generous and they met one another's needs voluntarily. And I love that about this church. And should we be like that? In much the same way, yes. I mean, things are different now. We all have our own uh, homes and own our own jobs sometimes. And we uh, have our own jobs and we have uh, bank accounts and hopefully savings accounts. And yet there has to be always a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Um, I don't know. Do we tell them about that lady we met the other night at uh, the restaurant? Lord, I um, we're so impressed with this lady. She was maybe, do you think, maybe 70? Yeah. And she was so gracious. I mean, she was a greeter at a restaurant here in Colorado Springs. Welcomed us in, made sure we were taken care of. And then I just kind of observed her. And she just was always working. She, If nobody was coming in the restaurant, she'd be cleaning a window. Or she'd be straightening up a table. Or just on, she was on mission, wasn't she? And had such a sweet spirit. And afterwards, I told Laura, and Laura noticed it too. I said, well, let's just bless her. Let's just bless her with uh, a financial gift. There wasn't a whole lot, but we felt led to do it. And I, I tell you this, to tell you, not to, to brag on us, because God impressed on me to do this and confirmed it with Laura. And we don't always do that. This person wasn't even our wait, waitress. She was uh, a greeter. She just seated us. But there was something about her that just made that whole experience better. And so anyway, uh, on the way out, I told her and I told her who we were and gave her a card from the church. And I said, you just blessed us so much. And we just wanted to give you and we gave her a $20 bill. So it wasn't a whole lot. And she immediately remember she deferred. She says, oh, no, no, you, I can't take that. I said, oh, please. I said, you blessed us. I said, the Lord wants you to have it. Remember what she said to us. She finally took it, but she said, now I can go get gas. To some folks, $20 is a tank. It's not a tank of gas, not anymore, of course. But it's, it's the difference between not having any money to get gas and having some money. I'm glad we followed that prompting. There's been many times, uh, sadly, the Lord's prompted me, and I haven't done it, done it, and I should have. What am I saying? I'm saying when we are attuned to the Holy Spirit and when we really begin become more observational, right? Learn to walk through the crowd slowly. See other people. Ask the Lord to help you see them through His eyes. And we'll never be in a hurry. It reminds me of motivational speaker Ogmandino. Laura, you've heard me say this before. Ogmandino said, well, here's what you should do. Treat everybody you meet like they would be dead by midnight. I've done that before. And when you treat people that way, I mean, your eye contact is intense. You really ask them how they are and you really want to hear. You just, it just alters your interaction. And that day, I'm so glad that night, that night we got it right because it really blessed that lady. But you know, honestly, she blessed us way more than we blessed her. When you see that, identify it call it out. What made the early church flow? Well, they were not afraid to pray for boldness after they were mistreated. They asked God to, to open up more opportunities and do increasingly more miracles and the spontaneous movement of God. And then they practiced unity and they did think of their possessions as their own. Remember this, we're just stewards of of everything we have. You know that? I mean, think about it. Obviously, I'm surrounded surrounded by books. I can't read all the books I have now. I don't even know why I have so many, honestly. And Laura's like, I know, I had to catalog them. Thank you for doing that. It's amazing. Because of her, everything in my library is by author. I can actually find books wherever I go. It's a miracle. Thank you. But you think about it. Why have thousands of books when you can't read, but so many now with life 
going as fast as it does. The point is, is, is learn to be a good steward, but don't hold on to anything too tightly. Do you know one of the Wesley brothers, and I can't remember if it was John or Charles, but one of the, the famous Wesley brothers who founded the Methodist Church, one of them was a famous circuit riding preacher, one of them was a prolific, song, song, prolific songwriter, but one of those brothers' house burned down. Remember hearing this story? And uh, someone came to him and, he, and they said, your house burned down, Mr. Wesley. You know what his response was? The Lord's house burned down? He didn't have a concept that anything belonged to him. And if you think about it, one day someone else will have these keys. Someone else will sit in this desk and be the pastor of this church. Do you know what someone once said, Laura? I love this. They said, every pastor is an interim pastor. <laughs> you know that? We're not here for long. You know what interim means? In the meantime. So while we're here in the meantime, God help us to be good stewards, to work towards unity and having the right spirit, the right heart, to be willing to share as God's given to you and um, be, be a generous person. I, by the way, you didn't know this because you were meeting with Colleen today, but I had this gentleman come in from, he's an engineer, he's 91 years old, and he's from Sweden. And he's a Gideon. You've you've met him. You've met him before, but he just came by just to to greet me, and he knows uh, uh, that we always have a good time when he's here. He encourages me. We often pray together, but he's ninety one years old, and what he did today, you didn't even know this because this is brand new news for you and the folks here. But he said, "Now next month's Pastor Appreciation Month, and I wanted you to be appreciated early." So he gave me a beautiful card uh, that's right over there somewhere. And this is so neat. And so so this 91-year-old engineer gives me this card today, Laura. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. And on the front of it, it says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. So he's thinking about me today. And in honor of me... He, as a Gideon, donated two Bibles will be distributed by members of the Gideons International to help transform lives through the Word of God donated by the Colorado Springs Gideons. That just happened today. That kind of spontaneous generosity is akin to what happened in the early church. That man today, for whatever reason, was prompted to come by and see me. Maybe not even knowing that when he did, how much it would bless me. Here's what the card says. The Lord has uniquely enabled you to bless the hearts of, and hearts and minds of many. Thank you for being his faithful servant. And then he wrote, how beautiful on the mountains are those who bring good news. Blessings from that wonderful Gideon. The early church really cared about each other. And sometimes I wonder, do we work on that, is the challenge of the text for all of us, to not be so preoccupied or busy or scheduled that you don't really think about others. And when God prompts you maybe to write a note or to uh, send a gift, follow through. In fact, maybe Jean will be watching tonight, Jean Coulter from Security. What a nice lady. And uh, such an encourager to Laura and I. And she knew that August was our 40th anniversary. So Jean, remember, uh, comes by with her son, Brian, and brings a beautiful plate that she had engraved celebrating our 40th anniversary. Jean, that act of kindness meant a great deal to us. Many of you watching have done that for Laura and I. You do just with your encouragement. And I pray that I can encourage you as well and that somehow, more and more, we uh, love one another and we're more like the early church than ever before. Do you notice that people there so land? When you get to the last two verses of Acts chapter 4, you realize uh, that that kind of spontaneity was modeled by someone you will be familiar with. But initially, his name won't be familiar to you. Verse 36. 
Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus by birth, the one the apostles called Barnabas, which is translated the son of encouragement, son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here is Barnabas. He is uh, an exhorter. He's an encourager. He's a balcony person. He pulled people up. He wasn't a basement person pulling people down. He pulled people up. And you'll find it interesting. He was a Jewish man from Cyprus. And he was a Levite. You say, Pastor, why does that matter? Well, that was the tribe that the priests came from. And Levites, you find this interesting, were not allowed to own property in Israel. So we find it interesting that he sold property and gave the proceeds to the early church. How could he do that? Because he owned property, most likely, in Cyprus. And so the point is, is somehow, maybe through an inheritance or some business deal, he had property of value and spontaneously, because he was immersed in a church that was other-minded, he felt compelled to give the gift, and he does. He lays the gift. The Bible says God loves a hilarious giver, right? Lays the gift at the disciples' feet, helped to uh, move the early church forward, just like um, I think of Lydia, the first uh, Christian uh, convert on the continent of, uh, of Europe in Philippi. She was a seller of purple. That's when they would uh, extricate uh, from uh, a selfish a little glands that they could make into a purple dye. She was a wealthy businesswoman, and she was a godly woman, and she helped the church. And I, by the way, I want to commend you for being faithful to helping the church through these pandemic times. I tell you, uh, we're doing well. Still a little tight sometimes, but you're faithful, and God is faithful, and we're making it. And we're, we're helping others. I love this. Last week, we took 35 lunches to the homeless and uh, down on South Nevada. And uh, we're going to keep doing that. We're going to take some lunches out tomorrow. And if you want to come and be a part of that, we eat here at the church at 1130. And then we'll take some lunches down to Nevada. You can come help us. And uh, it's just a tangible way of expressing the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray it is similarly what you would have found if you happened to be attending the early church. Well, folks, we have the obligation and the opportunity to make a difference. I want to commend you for making a difference and thank you for your faithfulness to the Lord's work. Your prayers from friendship to Laura and I means everything. Thank you for that. Let's pray. Father, you have blessed us in so many ways and we praise you. Help us to live out loud the faith that has sustained us through the challenges of our own lives. And God, build your church, one change life at a time. Bless everyone who's watching and bless their families, their personal lives, their financial lives. Help them to be generous and to help all of us to be generous and sensitive to the people you place in front of us and discerning to know when to help and when maybe it's not appropriate. Sometimes Maybe something would be misused. God, we often don't know the difference, but you do, and we pray for wisdom. Thank you for our country. We pray for the president and Congress and the senators, our men and women who serve uh, the armed forces, the men and women who serve as police around the country. We pray for the people in Afghanistan, that, that you'd protect them, and those American citizens there would be able to come home. And Lord, we just commit this world to you and pray with the early church that was so unified one heart one mind even so come lord jesus but before you come find us with our lives yielded to the one who's changed us from the guttermost to the uttermost that's who you are we praise you and love you in jesus name amen hope you have a great rest of your week Honored to have this time with you tonight, Pastor Mark Hensley, along with Laura from my office here in Colorado Springs, saying have a good rest of your night. Bye, folks.